Hey everybody, this is an expanded version of the circular flow. What's important to understand is that this is a model of the macro economy. It's got our five macro aggregate actors, which are businesses, the central bank of a country. Now I'm doing the United States here, so I'm putting the Fed right there, but that's the central bank of a country. They're the ones that control monetary policy. The government, households and the rest of the world and then we've got our four macro aggregate markets which is the product market you go there if you need goods and services currency market you go there if you want to exchange one currency for another the financial market you go there if you want financial capital and the resource market of course you go there if you want resources now here's what we're going to do is we're going to look at this this model right here which is called the circular flow that's not going to look all that circular by the time we get to the end but it's called the circular flow but what it really the importance of it is it allows us to see the macro economy as a whole now let's start with that circle first and it is an important circle because here's the thing guys i'm going to draw only money flows and here's the thing about the money flows the circle has the biggest money flows of them all okay so when i draw the original circle those are the biggest money flows. Now I'm going to draw a lot more money flows after that, but those money flows are all smaller. And let's understand something else. Again, I'm only drawing the money flows. I want you to understand that pretty much any time money flows somewhere, something else is flowing back. Now, if you don't understand what I mean, let me just show you very quickly. Let me start with my first money flow. Households. They take money to the product market, of course, to buy goods and services. Now, of course, goods and services are going back the other way. Now that money flows through the product market and heads over to businesses as revenue. So let's go ahead and get these labeled. This is consumption. This is revenue, okay? Now I'm not always gonna write it out completely. Like I said, just put a C there for consumption. Now this is the beginning of our circle, okay? Now that revenue, well revenue breaks down to cost and profit, okay? So that revenue is used to cover all the cost by a business, all right? And then if there's any money left over, that is the profit, so plus profit. Now, what are the costs to a business? The cost to a business, of course, are the wages, rent, and interest from a macroeconomics perspective. That's it, there's just three costs. Remember, we're macroeconomics, we aggregate things, we see things in big picture. So hey, we've aggregated all costs into those three costs. And again, if there's any money left over, that's the profit. Now here you go. You can associate that. Remember, here's a resource market: wages with land, rice with labor. Sorry, rent with land, interest with capital, and then of course profits with entrepreneurial ability. Now those money flows from a household perspective, the one that's providing the resources, so resources are going this way, the households are receiving this as income, right? So they provide resources, and here comes the money, here comes the income, there's the wages, the rent, the interest, and the profit. So let's go ahead and get that labeled really quickly. Wages, rent, interest, and profit. Now there is the main circle of the circular flow. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I want to just kind of show you GDP using the expenditure approach using this model. So what is the expenditure approach? It's consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus exports minus imports. And that gives us GDP. So basically it's our four aggregate actors that spend money and then we have to minus out the imports because we need to find out what was produced domestically. Okay, so here we go. We've already got consumption. Here comes business investment. All right. They borrow money from the financial market to do business investment, and they also use some of their profits, okay? So that's a kind of an ugly line right there. But anyhow, here's them using their profits. Here's them borrowing financial capital to do investment. So C and I. Now we've got our government purchases. There's our government purchases, all right? Now remember, these are money flows. The next thing I'm about to do confuses a lot of people. Watch this money flow. Okay, there, here's the rest of the world bringing currency there, getting dollars, bringing those dollars to our product market. That's a money flow, so that represents U.S. exports, okay? The goods and services are flowing back the other way. And now here's money going out, all right? That money going out is U.S. imports. Now again, if you take a, a look at this, you should be able to see C plus I plus G plus X. See those arrows going in? Minus the imports. That gives us... GDP. Truly, it gives us nominal GDP. So there's the expenditure approach. Now, as I go forward, I want to kind of just talk about our different actors individually to finish this thing out, okay? Let me start with households. 
They've got income coming in. That is not all of their personal income though, because government also supplies some income to households, and those are transfer payments or government transfers. So there's our transfer payments right there. Now, of course, households have to pay some taxes. So we're gonna go ahead and put taxes in right there. Now what I like to do is just kind of put a little dotted box right here to make sure that we understand that that is personal income. Here's the taxes that they're paying, and that leaves a household with disposable income. Now, of course, what does a household do with their disposable income? One of two things, either spend it in the product market or they save it. And that when they save it, they take it to the financial market. So this is our net savings, sometimes called private savings, okay? So net savings or private savings. Now this right here is going to be a very important fork in the road as we get further on in this course, okay? So I like to make sure that we see that fork in the road because that's going to be really important when we get later on in the course. So anyhow, that takes care of households. Now let's go with government. We've pretty much done most of government here, okay? We even have the three levers of fiscal policy. What's fiscal policy? A manipulation of the government's budget to help stabilize the economy. The three levers of fiscal policy, government purchases, taxes, and transfer payments. But here's the big thing, guys. A lot of times that inflow does not equal these outflows. A lot of times that inflow right there is less. Governments run deficits, and therefore they must finance those deficits. So where do they go to finance those deficits, which just means get money for the deficit that they have? Well, they go anywhere you go to get money, which is the financial market. So they go get that money from the financial market. That is called financing the deficit. All right. We have taken care of households, and we've taken care of the government. Now, the rest of the world, they interact in our product market, but it's also important to understand that the rest of the world takes money here. I'm going to make it a double-sided arrow, okay? So basically what's going on here is we've got, they bring capital into our capital markets and capital goes actually out of our capital markets to the rest of, of the world. This is just simply called a capital inflow to this domestic economy, which is the United States right now. This is a capital outflow, okay? And sometimes what we call this is net foreign portfolio investment, right? Big long word there. Net, money going both ways. Foreign, meaning it has to do with the, inter with the rest of the world. Portfolio investment to make sure that we don't confuse it with what we normally call investment in an economics class, which is the buying of real capital. Okay, so we've taken care of the rest of the world, interacting in our product market, in our financial market, noting that you have to go through an exchange market to interact in either one of these two markets, taking care of the government, taking care of households. Let's talk, oh, and we got businesses here, and we pretty much take care of them too, right? They've got their revenue, they can also borrow some money to do investment, they can use their profits to do some investments, and of course they're paying for their resources. So. One more uh, actor to talk about, and that is the central bank of a country. Now, let's just assume right now that we're in a recession. If we're in a recession, what would the Fed do? How would they interact with our economy? Here's what they would do. They would push money in. They put money into the financial markets. Technically, this is called putting reserves into the financial market, but at this point in the class, it's fine just to say that they're putting money into the financial markets. And by the way, conceptually speaking, not bad to just kind of think sometimes Hey, the financial markets, we're talking about banks, right? So banks are intermediaries. Those are the ones that are bringing suppliers of loanable funds together with demanders of loanable funds, right? So they're bringing money into that financial market. Again, no arrow going into the Fed. They control the money supply. This is the only box that we've got, an arrow of money coming out and no money going in. They're the only one with that power to do that. By the way, this is easy monetary policy. And one other thing, <clears throat> what is it that's going back the other way? I said that, hey, anytime you see a money flow, something's going back the other way. In this particular case, it's probably U.S. government bonds. This is a bond purchased by the Fed. Okay, so they're buying U.S. government debt. There's the bonds heading that direction so that they can get money into the financial market, drive interest rates down. Again, we're assuming a recession here. 
getting interest rates down to spur more uh, spending. Now, again, if this was a boom times, if this was an expanding economy, if this was an economy that was maybe uh, getting producing more than its full employment level of output, what would the Fed do? The exact opposite, because it would be trying to perhaps fight inflation, and it would pull money out, and those government bonds would go the opposite direction. But again, this would be if we had a recession. Anyhow, that's our macro economy. This is what we want to kind of be able to see all the time. This is the big picture view of this class. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in another video.